I'm a climate and energy researcher at Duke University. Since I moved to North Carolina just about two years ago, my new adopted state has had five declared emergencies, all having to do with wind and rain. The outer banks, those barrier islands just off the coast of North Carolina, are particularly vulnerable to these storm events, which are becoming more frequent and more intense. One of these islands is Ocracoke. Its year-round population could be an area code. It's said that Blackbeard met his demise here in 1718. Access is only possible by ferry, private boat, or private plane. It's at the end of the line, exposed to the ocean, connected to the United States through the island of Hatteras by a single electric cable. It's a draw for tourists, and it's ground zero for power outages. In September 2019, Hurricane Dorian slammed the Carolina coast after devastating the Bahamas. Ocracoke experienced seven foot floods in two hours. This is a foot higher than they've ever seen before. Record levels were in 1944, a foot shorter. Three days later, the island had no power. And by that, I don't mean people on the island had no power. I mean the island had no power. The grid was restored on the fourth day, but a week after the event, many people still didn't have electricity. WUNC reported three homes on fire as they were reconnected to the grid, something blue. Another 400 homes had to have their electric meters and wiring pulled out because of damage from flooding. Hurricanes aren't the only cause of power outages on Ocracoke. In June, the uh, single transmission line that connects the island to the rest of the country, there was a malfunction on the mainland, and Ocracoke had no power for several hours. Three weeks later, half the island lost power for several hours. In August 2017, Ocracoke lost power for a full week. A construction crew hit Again, that star-crossed transmission line coming onto the island, and power was out. 4,000 tourists were asked to leave the island immediately. Recall that the only way off the island are three ferries or a private boat or plane. Those who stayed behind, residents and tourists who couldn't leave the island, had no power until about the fourth day. Village generators were then activated, but people were asked to ration electricity. That meant no air conditioning, in August, no hot water. Uh, it meant people had to watch their food spoil, including businesses that had stockpiled for the tourist season. People also had to ration water because the public water system usually runs on electric pump and only had a half-powered diesel backup. All of these events, these emergencies, big and small, happen on Ocracoke. And when they happen, they always seem to cause or flow from some sort of power outage. Power outages then have cascading events that flow from them, new dangers that arise, downed power lines, spoiled food and water. Little Ocracoke is particularly vulnerable, but we should see it as a dry run for the massive power outages we could see anywhere in the United States, from an earthquake, a, some storm, a cyber attack, or a much more mundane event. Understanding the grid and preparing for its catastrophic failure must be part of a first responder's toolkit. First, some basics. Thousands of facilities generate electricity in the United States, ultimately serving 145 million customers, or meters. Electricity is conducted through wires from those generating facilities to wherever it is needed instantaneously. Each of these wires has a carrying capacity measured in megawatts. Carrying capacity is a function of the line's voltage, the pressure that a line can take, that pressure is what pushes electric current through the system, and distance, how far that electricity needs to travel. 
the longer the distance, the higher the voltage that is needed to move that same amount of electricity. Once power meets load, comes to a town or a heavy population center, for instance, it's stepped down through transformers to the distribution lines you see in your neighborhood. American power lines conduct alternating current, meaning that the current switches direction as it travels from positive to negative voltage and back to positive. The speed of that switching is called frequency. One hertz is one switch per second. Now voltage and frequency must be kept relatively constant for the system to work. This is a really tall order. The system is extensive. We're talking millions of miles of high and low voltage power lines and ever changing based on supply and demand of power. A power plant may go down. A car may hit a power line and knock power to 10 homes. I may decide to toast a piece of bread. All of these things, some more predictable than others, affect frequency. Changes in frequency or damaged power lines, meanwhile, can force a change in voltage. Too high a voltage, too much pressure, can destroy equipment very quickly. And anyone who's plugged an American hairdryer into a UK socket knows what I'm talking about. These events can cause power outages. So far, I've been talking about the grid as if it is a single thing. Not so. It is, in fact, a hodgepodge of overlapping physical and regulatory structures working in uneasy alliance to deliver power in real time. The US and Canada operate two AC grids, each humming along at a synchronized frequency of 60 hertz. These continental grids are cleverly called the Eastern and Western interconnects. It may come as no surprise that Texas runs its own grid, and that Quebec does the same in Canada. These four grids are then connected through limited direct current lines, allowing some amount of flow through all four regions. The interconnects describe physical grids, but within those physical structures on the US part of the interconnects, operation of the grid is managed through 66 balancing authorities. Some of these authorities are utilities, private or public, like Tennessee Valley Authority. Some are the seven electric, uh, competitive electricity markets that we have. They also operate the wires for multiple transmission owners. As their name suggests, these authorities cooperate with one another to balance supply with demand. Their work has gotten a lot more complicated since competition was introduced to the sector in the 1990s because those balancing authorities no longer own virtually all of the generation or the power lines within their territories. We have a much more decentralized system now, which is more efficient and more flexible, but also carries more risk. The Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, or FERC, regulates the transmission lines and those electricity power markets, except for the one in Texas. Meanwhile, the North American Electric Reliability Council, or NERC, sets technical standards with a goal of having no more than one day of outage every 10 years. The state public utility commissions regulate the distribution lines and most, but not all, of the generators. Sometimes states or local facilities, towns, cities own their own electric utilities. And electric co-ops operate regularly, or, you know, regularly unregulated. Among these interconnects, subject to multiple and overlapping authorities, the grid must nevertheless be managed as one integrated system. Knowing this, it is amazing power is as reliable as it is. It's even more remarkable when you realize how old the power grid is. The American Society for Civil Engineers gives our energy infrastructure a D plus, 
They note that most of our power lines were built in the 1950s and 1960s, and that when built, they had an expected life of 50 years. The infrastructure is not only aging, but it was built for a different time. It was built to drive current in one direction from large power plants that were sort of trundling along, putting out similar amounts of productivity every day, um, and it heading in one direction. Today, we are taxing this system because we're moving towards more distributed and more variable generation, and we are experiencing multi-directional current. So for instance, solar panels on your house are generating electricity during the day and sending current to the grid, but at night your home becomes an electric sink and draws current from the grid. Those same lines are having to manage both transactions. On any given day, about a half a million people lose power for two hours or more in the United States. These are largely unremarkable events and perhaps not even surprising given the complexities I've described. If you're a first responder, you've no doubt contended with a power outage. But what about longer outages? Think about how you use electricity. If you wake up in the morning, are you warm enough or does your heater have an electric starter? Are you cool enough or is your air conditioning or fans shut off? Can you drink water or flush the toilet or is your water system on an electric pump? Do you have food thawing in the freezer? Insulin warming in the fridge? Is your phone charged? Can you use Wi-Fi if your router is out? Is that caffeine headache kicking in from lack of coffee? Do you have a garage door opener? Are you able to get out of your garage? Do you have enough full fuel in your tank? Because without electricity, most fuel pumps don't work. If you start to drive through the neighborhood, what kind of hazards are there with downed power lines and maybe all the traffic lights out? Some homes and businesses have backup gas or diesel generators. These are very useful. They're also noisy and contribute to air pollution. And there are equity concerns about who is able to buy a generator. But after some time, the generator fuel runs out. And as days turn into weeks, what happens to your supplies? Food, water, fuel. How's the bathroom situation? Is there anywhere to get additional supplies? Are you being paid if you haven't been able to go to work? Can you get money with ATM machines down and the internet down? Are stores even open? Do you have security concerns without lighting or security systems and as desperation mounts? Now you factor in Alexa, smart appliances, electric vehicles. As we plug more of our lives into this complex grid, we become that much more reliant on this energy source and potentially more vulnerable. So what are all the points of failure in this system? What are the ways this can go wrong? Far and away, the biggest threat to the grid are storms. They knock out power lines, they flood power plants, they freeze piles of coal. Next and closely related are trees coming into contact with power lines. Utilities have tree trimming programs, but as you recall, we're talking millions of miles of lines. And even the most robust tree trimming program can be bested by a hurricane, a nor'easter, or another high wind or rain event. They may blow down a tree, knock off limbs from ice. Meanwhile, high temperatures can cause power lines to sag. And whenever a power line touches a tree, or gets close enough to the tree that the current can jump to the tree to be grounded, pow. From 2003 to 2012, storm events, usually starring large trees, caused 700 major outages in the United States, which means at least 50,000 customers were impacted. If climate models are correct, these grid stressors are only going to get more intense. Earlier this year, a Western utility reported a malicious cyber event. Hackers overwhelmed its Cisco servers, blocking access to the system. The disruption had little practical effect, but for as, as much as, so far as we know, this was the first attack of its kind in the United States. 
And it also made people realize that many of our utilities, interconnected again to those continental grids, use the same internet infrastructure that we do. The massive blackout in the summer of 2003, which plunged New York City and much of the Northeast into darkness for two days, was caused by trees and power lines making contact in Ohio. A bug in First Energy's software, meanwhile, made their computers unable to take in multiple complaint calls at once, delaying the ability to shore off power lines and keep them from being affected from catastrophic surges in voltage. Here, Gretchen Bakke reminds us, a catastrophe was caused by three trees and a faulty line of code. From cyber attacks to human error, from hurricanes to that tree down the street, we have plenty of growing threats to dodge. So what can be done? Utilities are starting to begin aggressive storm hardening programs. These include replacing wood poles with concrete, burying lines, and yes, trimming trees. The Florida Power and Light utility credits these kinds of activities with its reduced power outages during Hurricane Dorian. Technology is also helping utilities respond to outages more quickly. Smart meters can tell a utility in real time when your power is out. This is a vast improvement over the traditional way of finding out about an outage, where companies would triangulate complaint calls and then send a truck to drive around and look for the problem. Self-healing grids can isolate damaged segments of line, meanwhile, and reroute electricity to bring power to more people faster. But all of these approaches cost money and state utility commissions have to be willing to let utilities pass these costs on to consumers in order for the work to happen. And sometimes the price tag is just too high. In 2018, North Carolina rejected Duke Energy's multi-billion dollar proposal to underground every wire in the state. Going forward, states may need to revisit how they think about these cost-benefit allocations. For instance, most states don't consider the lost economic productivity caused by a blackout. If they did, some more of these programs might start to make sense. Investment in smart grids in critical locations, for instance. Burying every wire still might not be on the list of things to do. But as storms increase uh, and lengthen, the calculation really may change in states. And it's no surprise Recall I talked about Florida Power and Light, that Florida has been approving these storm hardening measures. Additional measures fall into sort of two camps. Some attempt to pump the brakes on change. They really see the retention of baseload nuclear and coal plants as key to keeping the lights on. Others want to lean into new technology. They see that a more decentralized grid is harder to attack, and they point to certain smart grid features as ways of increasing reliability and resiliency. But as they have these debates, we have to prepare for the next storm. It is coming, and based on recent trends, it may be sooner and more powerful than we think. So what can first responders do? First, Responders could work with communities to educate them about how to truly prepare for an extended outage. Toilet paper and a gallon of milk helps for that first day. After that, not so much. So thinking about the ways communities use electricity and then finding analog backups is really important. If the community has a lot of water wells where electric pumps are necessary to bring the water out of the ground, having manual backup pumps is really important and something worth educating the community about. If you need uh, firewood or charcoal to keep warm or to prepare food, it's really important to have those stores and to protect them from floodwaters if you're in a flooding event. Second, responders could work with communities to establish nanogrid response zones. These predetermined zones could be in a natural gathering place like a school or a house of worship they could be activated during an emergency and powered by solar fuel cells 
batteries, and generators, they could become the home base for local response teams before help arrives from the outside. Third, emergency exercises should assume there is no electricity in the impacted area and that it might not come back for some time. If those scenarios come to life, first responders won't be able to use high-tech tools. We'll need off-the-grid and old-school solutions. Following Dorian, one of the most useful things handed out in the Bahamas, other than water, were solar-powered lanterns with USB chargers for cell phones. Meanwhile, back on Ocracoke, islanders were really struggling the first couple of days after Dorian. They were cut off from the rest of the world, had no power, and every motor vehicle on the island had been damaged by the flood. Every single one. So they couldn't get generators from one part of the island to places where they were needed most. When that first ferry arrived with emergency supplies, the islanders came, met the ferry, thanked them and said, please come back with wheelbarrows. So as we build the grid of the future, we also have to remember to prepare ourselves for emergencies with laminated paper maps, solar lanterns, and wheelbarrows. Thank you. For the most part, given that we are such a big country geographically and very diverse in topography and climate, there is an expectation that in many parts of the country, even if there was a catastrophic outage, that within a week or two, you could bring supplies from other places. Meanwhile, the utilities, and I'm sure the first responders here know, are out there immediately, often during the storm, trying to figure out what's going on. So I think where we're seeing real stresses and real risks of longer outages are some of these more isolated communities, either on islands or in very rural places. Uh, there have been intense storms in the upper Pacific Northwest, for instance, where villages have been sort of left on their own for quite some time. There's then the sort of black swan event of, you know, the entire grid gets taken out by a cyber attack, for instance. Um, and I have not seen, I would love if other people here know about it and can point me to it, I have not seen research on what you do in that case. I've seen sort of thought experiment novel kind of, you know, approaches to this of thinking about what it would look like and how quickly would, you know, things turn to chaos. But I've not seen sort of emergency planning or political science or technical folks really thinking through those multi-month outages. Once the power goes out, I think some of these, thinking through some of these sort of analog tools that could be brought to the, the impacted community is really important. So, you know, it's certainly helpful to bring bottled water. It's even more helpful to bring a manual pump so that you can reactivate some of the community wells and get a larger volume of water flowing. So I think thinking about that sort of next order of how on a more of a you know, street scale, community scale, can we start to bring some normalcy back here? And it's not gonna be those high-tech tools, it's going to be the wheelbarrows, the solar lanterns, the water pumps. Um, so thinking about those things is really important. Great question. So we're actually looking into this right now. Um, in the wake of the hurricanes and the storm events last fall in North Carolina, just on the heels of those, Governor Cooper signed an executive order that dealt with climate mitigation but also climate resilience. And there's a statewide resiliency plan being put together right now. And as part of that, we've been trying to find that out exactly. It seems like, and again, have not, cannot say we've had a comprehensive review, but it seems like those things can pop up very individually where a family has thought to do this, um, and then not so much at the community scale. So we were thinking that this could be a niche, and it's something we're talking about with the, the state of North Carolina about suggesting that Ocracoke, for instance, have several of these nanogrids 
Um, and there you could also think of other non-electrified resources that you could have there, like a propane-powered refrigerator, and then people would know they could bring their insulin there and have it stored there until they get refrigeration. We are concerned about aging infrastructure, a sort of shifting electricity system in the United States from more centralized to more decentralized. Um, we're concerned about increased frequency and intensity of storms. Uh, cyber attacks that have been popping up around the, the world certainly are of deep concern. Uh, but you know, that's sort of the nature of this. We don't know until it happens that it's going, it's going to happen. Thank <music> you.